Our Father in heaven, we bless you and we thank you for your love. And we thank you for allowing us to uh, be in front of your word today. And I pray that you uh, open our hearts. I pray, uh, well, we open our hearts, Lord, and I pray that you deposit your word in our hearts so we can glorify your name, so we can realize your heart and follow you. Be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Today's message is uh, titled From the Inside Out and uh, inspired on the scriptures of Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 14. And let me read it for you. This is what the Bible says. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. And sincerely, uh, today I want to accomplish something, and it is uh, to be able to help us to understand how God can transform a a person's life. Remember, we come from uh, the call of Jesus that we should Pray, uh, preach uh, repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And uh, sometimes uh, that sounds a lot like in a language that we don't realize the extension of it. And today I want to give you a, a little sense of it. I, I want to give you a taste of what is forgiveness of sins. What is that work of, the, of God with his spirit in our life, that transformation that really happens from the inside out, that really happens in the whole person? You know, I believe that some of you have heard many messages, have heard some people telling you, uh, come to the church, let's do this, let's do that. And you say, well, that sounds nice, but you know, I don't think that really something serious is going on. Well, that's what I want you to know. That's what I want you to perceive. How is that God can transform somebody's life and true and make it a complete new deal? All right? So for that, we need to understand that uh, life and religion are not the same thing. The concept of religion is what the world understands. It is what we're living, but it's not exactly. You know, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary describes religion as the belief in a God or in a group of gods, an organized system of beliefs, you know, ceremonies and rules used to worship a god or a group of gods, and also an interest, you know, a belief, something, an activity that is very important to a person or a group. So you see that there's these key words here, you know, a god of a group of god, a system of beliefs, and something that is very important. You see, that is religion, according to the Mary and Western Dictionary. But let me tell you about our faith, about our life in Christ, that is completely something different than the description that the world is given. In that regard, our faith is about life. It's not about uh, an activity. It's not about a special interest. It's a life. And we do not believe in a God. We believe in the God because there is only one God who created the heavens and the earth. So we don't believe in a God or much less in a group of gods, but we believe in the God, the God who created the heavens and the earth. So there is an abysmal difference between these two concepts. Our faith is not a system of beliefs ceremonies or rules no 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 our faith is embracing the revelation of the god of heaven you see there is a difference we can create ourselves a, a series of beliefs a series of systems and rules that you know because god made us smart we can we can create things 
So, but no, it's not about anything we created. It's not about a system that I, you know, because I'm so smart. No, no, it's, it's the revelation. It's something that I couldn't know by myself. God has revealed himself to us, and that is our faith. It's about the God's revelation. So our faith is not just an important activity like it is classified as a religion. Uh, uh, no, our faith is what defines our lives. That is, faith is not something important. It's what defines our life. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Without faith, there's no deal. There's no business. You understand? So there is a an abysmal difference between religion and the life of faith in Christ, right? As mankind, as mankind fails to harmonize his senses with the truth of God, the truth of God, therefore we struggle to figure the essence of life, the real state of human nature, uh, and consequently. We, we don't understand the dynamic for a meaningful existence. You see, that is what I want. And I'm, I'm going to try to go as simple as I can. Uh, managing, you know, the, the biblical terms, uh, the application of theology to our reality here about the forgiveness, the change that God does in us, the transformation that happens in the life of a Christian when you come to believe in God. And about that, we can talk about uh, an example that is in the scriptures that I love. You see, in the in the book of Acts, in the book of Acts is the story of the church. And in the book of Acts, starting on verse 9, there is the life of uh, somebody called Saul of Tarsus. And Saul, for you to get to know him, let me tell you on verse 13 and 14 of chapter 9, what kind of a man he was. It says, uh, he was a man that persecuted the church and went against the church everywhere and used his resources. He was a powerful man. He was an instructor man. He had uh, uh, good... Uh, 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 contacts with the government so he went after the church with soldiers with everything and even death happened because of his work so one day he's going after the church and he finds out that the church is property of the God of heaven because he found out the Lord Jesus showed up put him off the horse he had to beat the dust of the ground and start asking, what's going on here? And the Lord said, uh, you're persecuting me and that is terrible for you because it's like you're trying to punch a knife. <laughs> Only it's you who's going to be hurt. But I want to do something with you, Paul. And so Paul got blinded by the Lord. He was there all depressed and trying to figure out what was going on with his life. And the Lord calls one of his people called Ananias and said to Ananias, go and pray for Paul so he gets his eyesight and train him as a disciple. And this is what it says on, on chapter 9 and verse 13. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. So Ananias himself, a child of God that is hearing the voice of God, is saying, I don't think it's a good idea that I go to deal with this guy because he's terrible. He's really bad against us, Lord. Don't you have a better idea? You know, but what you want, I want you to see there is, what kind of a man was Saul? What kind of a man was this? It was a terrible man against the church. They didn't love him. They feared him. They feared him. Okay? But look what happened 
when Ananias went and prayed for him, and then he stood with the disciple for some time, and he was trained, and he learned about Jesus, and he started a new life. On Acts chapter 14 and verse 3, so Paul and Bart, number one, his name was changed to Paul instead of Saul. Then he was Paul, okay? Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there speaking boldly for the Lord who confirmed the message of his grace by enabling them to perform signs and wonders. Uh-oh. So the guy that was a persecutor of the church, the guy that was a, a, a monster for them because they feared him terribly for what he was doing to them, now he is proclaiming the same message they were. Now he's a person that his life is dedicated to talk to others about Jesus. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? That is what I want you to understand. Yes, it is possible. Yes, that's the kind of work that God does in somebody's life. He changed even his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Probably about a little more than a year later, we have a new report. Now he has a new name, Paul. And Paul speaks boldly about the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. I understand that it could be difficult to understand if we don't know the power of God. If we don't know what God teaches, if we don't know the revelation of God about his, himself living with man, what can change a person so drastically? <laughs> yes. You see, it was so drastic that in a moment, when you go to Acts chapter 20, you're going to hear Paul himself. You know, not so the new Paul himself saying, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. You hear that? His task was to persecute the church and see them being killed. But now, his task is to testify the good news of God's grace. And he was the perfect person, I would say, of God's grace. Because turning somebody who is killing your people into somebody who is making your people, that is God's grace. He didn't deserve none of that. Like Ananias said, Lord, you better think of something different, right? <laughs> hallelujah, hallelujah. That's, that's the way God works. And there is a rationale there, and I want to get into that. But before I get into that, I'm going to give you a contemporary story. You know, I have somebody with me today that has had that kind of a change. And his name is uh, Afortunado Correa, but, but his real, I mean, we call him by... Neo, and there's a whole story about this new name that he has. But I'm going to let Afortunado to tell you about his story, okay? And then I will explain to you the theology behind this as, 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 as simple as we can in the time we have available, all right? Let me leave you with Afortunado here. Greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you, Pastor, for the privilege. Uh, I want to thank God and give him glory for all that he is. Um, my name is uh, Fortunado Correa. Um, most people know me by Neil. 
Um, but uh, I do want to say uh, I was a little nervous, but God is in control. Um, I'm going to just give you a little bit of background on me. Um, I grew up in the uh, South Bronx in New York. I was raised by good parents, but I chose the wrong road. Over the years, I've been in and out of prison, did drugs, all different kind of drugs. Um, but uh, the story I really want to tell is about what happened in 2012, July 12, 2012. Uh, I was uh, my bitter end, uh, one of many other times uh, my drug runs for so many years over 30 million years, just coming in and out and going back into drugs and back into life. Um, but I was arrested on 2012, July 2012, not far from here, actually in Penn and Philadelphia Street. And uh, I remember an officer approaching me um, after me having three or four months without baiting, without sleeping in abandoned houses, uh, stealing to get high, to get the next fix. Uh, I was going through withdrawals. A police officer approached me and said, uh, son, is your name so-and-so? I said, yes. And they handcuffed me, um, took me into the prison. Uh, and in there, I was uh, about 40 mile days, maybe, maybe 40, 45 days, going through withdrawals in the jail cell by myself. Uh, just throwing up, you know, going through his jaws, banging my head against the wall because of the pain and the miseries of his jaws. Uh, I was at my bitter end. Uh, I was up to about maybe 40, 50 bags of individual heroin bags a day, really bad. Uh, restore my bridges when I got out of prison in the past, got family back in my life, and just to destroy it again and go back to the old life. And finally, I got arrested, was put in prison for this last time. It's been uh, almost eight years now. Uh, but in that jail cell, that cold jail cell, I had an encounter. And I learned that for me, it wasn't just knowing about God and hearing about God and running to a God that, uh, that I was taught about. But it was more having a personal encounter, kind of like the story that the pastor just shared about Saul, about Paul. Something like that. It was like he knocked me off my horse, and I was in this jail cell, and I was contemplating, like, I didn't want to live no more. Like, I really meant it. There was times in my life when I said, uh, I don't want to live no more. I'm tired of this. I'm tired of hurting people. I'm tired of committing crimes. I'm, I'm tired of running from life. But I never meant it. When the euphoria went away, I went back to that old life, you know, got clean for a while in prison, got put my weight on my body from eating food and stuff in jail, go back out, last for maybe a couple of months, maybe a year, and just go back in, into that same life. A misery, pain, destruction, destroying family, destroying lives, hurting society as a whole. Um, but this time, when I was in that jail cell, I thought about it. I said, God, I really want to die. And I kept going through his jaws, kept going through pain. But one thing has changed. And one day, I just said, God, man, and I, to this day, I say it's my, my most powerful prayer. And you can excuse me, because I'm, I'm in my little nervous standing up here. Um, I said, God, if you don't do something with Neil, he's going to die. And from that day forward, I started praying, I started reading, I started looking for this God. Instead of religion, looking for a relationship with the God and the creator of the heaven of the earth, the one that created me. I, there's got to be something to this God. I can't keep running. And lo and behold, he transformed my life to this day. To this day, um, I stood nine months in that county prison praying, reading every day, meditating, praying for other people, people praying for me, um, really getting to know this God that I heard so many people who said, you know, he loves you, and I, I believe it sometimes, but I, I ran to him only when I was in trouble. Um, 
and I learned to build a relationship with the God I created me versus the God that I created over the years. Um, it's a wonderful life. Um, I'm radically in love with him. Um, come this July the 12th, uh, God willing, it'll be eight years uh, that I've been involved in the church. I've been involved in this life with God. I've been building a relationship with him, a personal and intimate relationship with the one that created me. Um, I work for an organization that actually helps people get out of their life. You know, um, it's a, it's kind of like a transitional living situation, but we help people uh, they come out of prison that need uh, another chance of life, another chance to walk this life. Um, um, and I'm involved with a lot of people that uh, that help me out, that support me. Um, members of my uh, with my job, you know, people that I work with, that help me live this life. And I've been doing this for about, I said about three and a half years. Um, it's been a great thing, you know. Excuse me if I'm sporadic here and there, and <laughs> it's different years. I'm, I'm getting into the stories of different times of, of my life. Um, but this ain't really about me. This is about the God that transformed me and the, the God that can transform anybody's life. Um, no circumstance, no uh, tough time, no, uh, no matter how low we are, there's a God that loves us. There's a God that can change our reality. Um, uh, I don't know, uh, it's, it's been a wonderful journey, uh, and through the pain, through the circumstances, I'm not saying that I don't go through stuff, I still go through stuff, I'm not the, the great I am, he is the great I am, you know, and I still go through trouble, uh, I still go through storms, um, but through God and with God, with his power, I, I learned to walk in the rain instead of waiting for the rain to stop. He's guides me, I show him my life. Um, my conscience is, is, is a new conscience, and my reality is a new reality. Um, uh, I don't know, I, I just love God, I love this life. Uh, he can transform any life, no matter where you come from, who you are. And the message is that we, we come from a life of tyranny, a life of destruction, a life of pain, a life of loss, and we could be found if we come to him, you know. But only through Christ, this is possible, you know. There's no other way. There's no other God. He is one God. Um, I believe this wholeheartedly. It's been my experience. Uh, people ask me uh, sometimes that uh, the God is this. Uh, I said, well, if God didn't exist, I wouldn't be having this conversation with you. He does exist. He lives in us. He lives through us. He empowers us. You know, it's a journey where I, when I first started this journey, I felt like I was a soldier of God. Then I became a warrior of God. Today, I just want to be a weapon in the hands of the living God, a weapon for humanity, a weapon for uh, a city, a weapon to help other people get out their life, uh, learn pe how to live in, in unity. Um, I don't know, it's been a great journey. This is what it looks like to, in the sense of the work that comes from the inside out. Uh, there's more work to be done, guarantee you. <laughs> uh, he's still working. I'm still waiting, you know. He is God. So I'm glad to have this opportunity to share my story. Um, I'm glad to, that God is in my life. You know? uh, I don't know what else to say. Like. I am very unworthy, but he is worthy of all glory, praise, and honor. And everything I do, however I live, I just try to live to glorify him, to give pleasure to his heart, that he could sit in his throne and look down on me and say, well done, my great and faithful servant. And to all, there is a God. There is a chance. All you got to do is come to him. Open your heart to him. I've been in this church uh, about almost eight years now. And I've been here since day one, <laughs> and I love it. It's a great life. Uh, thank you for uh, your patience, uh, for listening to me. Um, and yeah, my name is Afortunado Correa.
but I am Neil. Hallelujah. He is Neil. He is new. And uh, <clears throat> as simple as that, you can you hear him. He can say it a lot much better than I do. But I'm going to try now to um, to help you figure how is this in tune with with God's uh, ways of doing things because. You know, that we have some problems there. Uh, people, you know, ask about God and see a work of, and somebody like Neo and, and uh, they cannot figure it. And especially because, you know, I have friends that have told me before, well, I, it sounds nice, you know, the gospel thing, but I cannot do that. I don't think I can. You know, I have to get rid of so much before I can start doing that. And, and I understand that they don't understand. So let me help you uh, here with, with God's revelation because I cannot really figure it by myself. I'm not a psychologist or anything close to that. So, but the work of him didn't happen because of psychology. It happens because of God. He said it. He was. It is. God who started it, it is God who made it happen, it is God who made it, make it stand. So let me go to uh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9 where we are and read some of the scriptures there and uh, try to put some sense so you figure how is that work, God works this out. You see, when we, when we read uh, um, um, Hebrews chapter 9, it says in verse 1, Now the first covenant had regulations for worship and also an earthly sanctuary. You see, it starts talking about <clears throat> a first covenant. There was this relationship with God. There was this pact with God in which God dealt with man and gave them some instruction to prepare his work in us. Right? And... Uh, so he called it the first covenant or the law and has regulations for worship. So uh, when you read chapter 9, you're going to see that it talks about those regulations for worship. You know, it talks about uh, the, 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 the things that were in the temple, the different areas, and what was the things that were done in the different areas. But it comes to... Uh, a key place uh, where it talks about the it talks about the presence of God. It talks about the most holy place that was a place that they had problem to be in it because uh, because of sin, you know, because of sin. But the most holy place is a place that talks about God's presence. It talks about the work of God in us. It talks about access to God. And when it's explained it there in Hebrews 9, explain it saying that not too many people could go to, uh, could take part on that place. See, um, it says on verses 6 through 10, when everything has been arranged like this, the priests entered regularly into the outer room to carry on their ministry. But only the high priest entered the inner room, that a special place, and that only once a year and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. And I want you to understand these things because these things were established to be a guide for us to realize what God was going to do in Christ and how today we can have a new life in Christ. So it's talking about here how with these regulation, regulations, they, they did uh, went to uh, to the temple and went to different places except that the inner room, the most holy place, not to uh, so, uh, there was no access to it. 
except to the high priest just once because the presence of God was very limited because of our sins. And in verse 8, it says that the Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still functioning. This is an illustration for the present time indicating that the gifts and sacrifices being offered were not able to clear the conscience of the worshiper. They are only a matter of food and drink and various ceremonial washings, external regulation applying until the time of the new order, the time of the neo. You got it? You see, there the, were in the past all these sacrifices of animals and all these rituals and all these things, and all of that was just preparing us, but it couldn't really change our lives. That's it, what it's saying there, okay? So when you say, I don't think I can do that. Yes, I understand. You're living still on the first covenant. You don't know God yet. So in the old covenant, there was no access to God as there is in the new covenant. And let me tell you a key. You know, the presence of God is key for transformation. You heard Neil telling you. It's not about a religion. It's not about a system of things. It is about God himself doing it. You know, in the book of Genesis, when uh, Cain, you know, killed his brother and God punished him, this is what Cain said to the Lord. My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. You heard Cain saying that? I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. That was the life of a Fortunato before. You know, restless. Wanderer. Just going from here to there, sleeping who knows where. And exposed to be killed every day. Every day exposed to death, destruction. The presence of God is the one who makes the miracle. God himself participating in our lives is key. And the Psalm 114, listen what it says. Why mountains did you leap like rams? You hills like lambs. Tremble earth at the presence of the Lord, at the presence of the God of Jacob, who turned the rock into a pool, the hard rock into springs of water. That is what God does. He takes the hard, dry, dead person and turn it into living waters. You can hear that? When God comes to the picture, Things change. So in, in, in Hebrew chapter 9, it's telling us in the past that couldn't happen because there was this prohibited access to God's, uh, to God's presence because of sin. Sin. That's what it says in the Isaiah 59 that our sin has established a separation between us and God. You hear? So, in the first covenant, in the old order of things, yeah, we, we looked alike the concept of religion that we saw in the Merriam-Webster, but the Bible teaches that was a guy. It was a nanny who took us by the hand to Jesus. When Jesus comes, then reality happens. Look what it says on verse 11. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are now already here, he went through the greater and more, more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, is not part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but he entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood. 
thus, thus obtaining eternal redemption. He bought us again. He delivered us again. He uh, took us out of the mug. This is a complete different story that goes beyond the tabernacle made by human hands and the blood of animals that are inferior beings without any real difference, uh, reference, I'm sorry, to us. We need to stop doubting, frustrated, knowing that we cannot accomplish that re redemption on our own. That is true for everybody. You are not lost on that. I cannot deliver myself. I can, Neo can, couldn't fabricate what God did in his life so he could be able to be nervous before you, but telling you, God changed my life. Hallelujah. Hmm. Hallelujah. The blood of goats and bulls. And the ashes of the heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonially unclean, sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. That's what it says. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. There is the difference. There is the new person. The blood of Christ not only deals with the acceptance of a person as clean, but cleanses us from the inside out. Cleanses us from the inside out. It's a miracle, people. I, I'm, I'm here. Going and coming with the scripture verses and thoughts. But what I'm trying to bring before you is nothing less than a miracle. The miracle of salvation. The miracle of uh, the new birth that is expressed in the scriptures. The miracle of God's transformation of a man's life is a miracle. I'm not telling you go and do a diet, you know, go and um, they make these exercises. Oh, no, 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 no. We are talking about a universal plan that God has from the very beginning for us to be able to have a relationship with him. For us to be able to change our misery into the beauty of a children of God. Of the children of God child of God hallelujah the blood of Christ that is miraculous that is a, a spiritual reality that it cannot be measured or uh, examined under a lab uh, microscope or something that mm -mm, we're talking about spiritual realities that if God do, does, doesn't reveal them to us we would be still lost in our craziness and having thousands of gods like the people of Athens. And there are people that prefer that. We don't want him to rule us. Yes, that's part of the old nature. But if you come to God, it doesn't matter if you understand the theology. What matters is that you come before him and that you trust that whatever Jesus did, even when you don't understand it logically, whatever Jesus did brought you, brought you, gave you redemption, gave you forgiveness of sins. Your past is erased. There is a new creation in Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the blood of Christ is not simply an outwardly situation. It's a holistic situation. He transforms us from the inside out and the whole of us is transformed. And you know, a mistake that there is out there is my mistake. And this is my mistake that I thought because I didn't steal or I didn't kill, I had no problems. 
but that was just pure blindness. Pure blindness. So the key is to know where is our faith. Do we keep saying that we are just sinners and we're going to keep on sinning no matter what? Or are we going to trust the work of Christ on the cross for us? Yes, that is the challenge. So if you believe in God, this is, I'm going to give you just a couple of, uh, two, three more scriptures to, so you stick to them. Okay? This is God saying. All right? So this is the truth and this is the powerful revelation that makes the difference for a salvation from the inside out. In Ephesians chapter 2, this is what Paul said to the Ephesians. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world, but now in Christ Jesus, but now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That you need to remember. If you are a believer, you need to remember you were far, not anymore. You're brought near. If you haven't put your trust in Jesus, you need that. Come to Jesus. You're going to be brought near him. And you're going to live with him. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 through 21 says, For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors but with the precious blood of Christ. That's what Christ is key. Is with the precious blood of precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in the last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God. Yeah. Faith and belief in God, it is bound to Christ himself. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. You remember what Neil was said? <laughs> it's not me. It is God. If God is not there, if his presence is not there, remember Cain saying, Oh, I cannot bear this without your presence. I'm lost. I am lost. Neo is lost. Everyone is lost. Hallelujah. Through him you believe in God who raised him from the dead and glorified him and saw your faith and hope are in God. All of this explanation is to justify that God calls us holy. We are holy, we are sanctified, and we are able to live a holy life. Not anymore beating the dust without God, without hope in the world. Revelation chapter 1 Verses 5 and 6 says, To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priests to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Yes. A drug addict without solution. They call him flacco. They call him thin, skinny guy. No hope. Today he's serving, serving his God and Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
Paul, I mean, so, yes, so, Paul used to be a persecutor of the church and became the, one of the greatest proclaimer of the gospel message. And God was with him with wonders and signs. What he cannot do with you. God works it out from the inside out. He completes the world, the work in your life. It's a, it's a whole of you that he transforms. It's a whole of you that he makes new. It's a whole of you that he wants to take to heaven. Trusting him. Remember, in Christ, we believe in God. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord be with you. Let's pray. Father, how good it is to see your love, your care for our lives. How good it is to see how you transform the lives of peoples through all ages. All ages. You did it with uh, Moses. You did it with David. You did it with um, Paul, you did it with Peter, you did it, you did it with everybody that trusted in you. And you did it with Neo and with me and uh, with Alex and so many more, Lord, in this era. I thank you. I bless you. And I pray that your spirit bring conviction to everyone who's listening in this very hour. So they can realize that you have a life for them in Christ. I beg you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hallelujah.